Hello everyone. Again. Happy New Year's. Today we're going over the game from the uh Tata Steel Tata Steel Tournament 2017 that just uh took place between Grandmaster Wesley So, who is playing very well as of late, and against the um Grandmaster uh Richard uh Rapport. And now, Rapport is known for playing some unorthodox openings, but um, in the line of Jabava. But uh, he's a very exciting player. And this game was an exciting game. It takes two players to make an exciting game. Somebody has to uh, take chances. So let's get started. Knight f3 from uh, Wesley So. Knight f6. G3 from Wesley So. B6. So we have some type of um, like Indian game, Queen's Indian uh, hybrid. D4. Bishop B7. And uh, we can say that basically these players have avoided any serious opening preparation and just have decided to play a game of chess. C4. And for those of you who are into openings, to, you know, it's starting to look like a Catalan where um, black is actually able to um, fan Kedowitz Bishop due to this knight being on um, F3. Normally, uh, black would not be able to do it. So, for instance, in the Catalan proper, we just show you real quick. Let's say d4, knight f6. Let's say black wants to play this queen's Indian to c4. Right? Normally goes like this, e6, and g3. So now on b6, you can't get into it right away. Okay, so in this game, they kind of finagle with the move order a little bit, and uh, Report has got it set up with his bishop here on this diagonal. All right, so bishop g2, bishop e7, and we have a transposition basically into a queen's Indian defense. Many times, the bishop will go here, check. And then return to e7. And that move is not a waste of time, but uh, simply to uh, misplace one of uh, white's pieces and blocking this um, square on d2. Sometimes a knight will go here. Sometimes a bishop will go here. It kind of forces white to make uh, a decision about where to place the pieces. Sometimes this bishop on c1 belongs on this diagonal, but after the check, it sometimes winds up here. Then white has to move it again. Sometimes a knight will wind up here when he wants to knight here. But um, report avoids that and just plays bishop e7, which is acceptable. Castles, castles, knight c3. And we have a normal queen's Indian defense here. Knight e4, d5 is playable, but uh, keeping... In the hypermodern spirit, uh, Black is playing with his pieces here. And he's fighting for e4 without using the pawns, but just simply using his pieces. Bishop d2. Now, if white takes, this is, this is decent for uh, Black. This bishop will be here for a while, and as soon as this knight moves on f3, be glad to exchange. So bishop d2. Bishop f6. He's putting more pressure in the center. Rook to c1. And knight 
takes d2. So he report gets the bishop here. And he still has to keep an eye on e4 somewhat. But here his plan is um, with the exchange of the bishop on d2. His plan is to play d6 and then e5 playing on the dark squares. So he's going to allow white to get in the move e4. But he's going to uh, play in the, on the dark squares in the center. As you'll see in a few moves. So there it is d6. This knight often goes to d7. There's d5. So we see the bishop being um, shut off here. But white gives up the c5 square in the process. The pawn comes to e5. And white plays e4. So both players have achieved their goals so far in this position. White has a space advantage on the queen side. And black has a little bit more space advantage on the king side. Now, I always talk about uh, closed positions. And when, to, when it's safe to execute a flank attack and when it's not safe. Um, in this position, um, it's pretty much blocked in the center. So therefore, it is safe. For these players to start um, <coughs> executing their plans for an attack on the wings. And you will see uh, that happening in a short order of moves. As you will see the play begin to shift from the center. Now that the center has been established with white having more space in the center. Now you will see the uh, play start to uh, shift to the flanks. Where... Uh, black will try to uh, dissolve white center that way and uh, also play around the center if he cannot dissolve it. Notice too that the closed nature of the position neutralizes black's two bishops. So although we're taught that the bishop pair is good to have, uh, this is all relative to the pawn structure. So we see in this particular position the bishop pair... Uh, is not exactly uh, being felt as they say uh, in a lot of chess manuals. The power of the bishop pair is best when the board is uh, is more open. Nevertheless, that's not to say that the position won't become open later, but it's good to keep that in mind as you plan your strategy. So black having the bishop pair decided to go in for a closed uh, position which actually favors the two knights that uh, Wesley So has. Another feature of the position is that White's bishop is not not too stellar. As we see, the bishop is biting on his own granite in the center as the three central pawns are all uh, on light squares. This indicates to me that this bishop on um, g2 will have to be moved Perhaps here at some time, which is a great clear diagonal. So right now the bishop is serving more defensive uh, purposes. Okay, so let's let's uh, continue on. So as I said, the play should uh, start to move uh, to the flanks. Knight d7, and we can see out the eye on this square right here now when I say play on the flanks one of black's options is to try to engineer the move f5 which is a natural move uh, to play against this e4 point also will open up lanes uh, for the rook again black uh, play bishop uh, to f6 earlier so it's it's I just wonder what was going on in his head because it seems like he has like changing you know changing plans on the fly because if I knew that I would eventually be trying to opt for this kind of position and playing f5 I wouldn't I probably wouldn't have placed my bishop on f6 
However, one of the good things about having a closed position is that time isn't as critical and that you can quote unquote waste the move sometime that would or a move do a move that would be considered a waste in an open position. You can get away with it in closed positions. So for instance, he can probably get away with moving this bishop back at some point in order to engineer f5. Other break possibilities for black would be c6. Only thing is he has to keep an eye then on a d4 pawn after any possible exchange. So those are things he has to look out for. So out of his two breaks, c6 and f5, it probably probably would be safer to play on the on the king side here. So cuz after f5 he's not uh he has an open f file where his rook is already placed and he's not um allowing white this powerful opportunity down the d file against his pawn. The white on the other hand probably has his most chances on the king side. Oh, excuse me, on the queen side. With moves like b4 followed by c5, etc. And utilizing this rook, which is already nicely placed on the c file. So, these are white's, these are white's breaks. White can break here at c, uh, c5 or f4. Again, each break uh, has its pros and cons. One of the negatives about breaking on f4 for white is having this uh, pawn that would be weak on e4 after the after a possible exchange let's say this knight was out the way f4 was played and black captured what happens as a result is this pawn in e4 becomes vulnerable to attack this pawn would be out the way so now this bishop becomes very powerful on the diagonal and then eventually you know, this knight is here or whatever moves like queen e7 followed by rook a e8 piling up and utilizing that open e file or a semi open e file would be better for black so although play is possible on both sides of the board uh for each player each grandmaster must decide which which break is the best so I'm telling you right now that the best break for black over here is f5, and the best for white is playing on the queen side with uh, c5. Right? That's your gen. That's the general strategy, and of course, tactics are are king. But the general strategy is for black to break over here, and for white to break over here. Let's see what happened. So c uh, e4 was played. Knight d7. H4. Now you might say, "Hey, I, you uh, you just said that Black's best plan is to uh, excuse me, White's best plan is to play on the queen on the queen side." This is true. However, sometimes it pays to try to hinder or slow down the opponent's counter attack, the opponent's uh, uh, attack. So even though White might not want to play on the king side specifically. He feels that, hey, let me just stop the counterplay first, and then I can go with my plans uh, unabated. <clears throat> but definitely, the plan with a3, g6, for instance, b4. Bishop G7 uh, suggest themselves. <clears throat> so H4 is played. And now white, excuse me, black also has an interest, can also take time to hinder white's plans if, if he wishes. He could play A5 and hinder the movement of these pawns. He can't stop them, but it slows, it slows uh, white down a little bit. Right, he can play a5, throw this knight in here. And that's what he does. So, although his main um, main desire is not to play over there, both sides are taking these type of uh, prophylactic measures against each other's main plans. So now, 
White, in order to get this advancing, has to play slower. He has to play B3, A3, followed by B4, etc., and try to set up the break here. Perhaps moves like Knight E3, Knight, uh, I'm sorry, Knight E1 to Knight D3, and set these breaks, set these breaks up. A5 is played. Notice that the B4, B5 square is left uh, somewhat vulnerable. And also note that A3 can be a little dangerous after moves like A4. Because this uh, makes it very difficult for White to achieve his break. Because always after B4, then there will be an en passant. And then there will be no way for white to take over that square. This is why the B3, A3, and B4 have to be played in that order. There it is, improvement of the bad piece. Again, we see black playing against, we see, excuse me, we see white playing on the king side, right? And these are more, more so like defensive prophylactic moves, anticipating uh, black's plan coming to salt over there but sometimes playing on the same side where your opponent is stronger helps the opponent and uh, even though h4 is done in a prophylactic sense nevertheless we can count this as a net weakening of the king side as it helps it will help black to be able to pry open the position more for instance there are already themes here for instance that if this knight was gone there's already sacrificial themes against this pawn even moves like g5 and things like that so uh soul has to be very alert let's keep going knight c5 right natural move king to g2 again more uh prophylactic prophylaxis bishop c8 good move um by uh, Richard Rapport, he decided, he's like, hey, my bishop's not doing anything. Trade him off. Right? So now the question is, who's going to benefit more from the uh, discip the absence from the bishop on the light squares? That's, the, that's basically the question when making that move. Obviously, Rapport, excuse me, Rapport feels he's going to be okay. Now, here's how I look at it. I look at Look at it like this. White has the worst bishop out of the light square bishops. White has the worst one because he has three pawns in the center on light of his own pawns on light squares. So he has the he has the worst bishop. He has it on the best diagonal he can place it on, which is h3, but he has the worst bishop. And when his bishop is gone, yes, his light squares will, will suffer a net weakness. Because the light square bishop controls the light squares. But at least he has some representation on the light squares in the form of these pawns. Okay, so he's not just losing all um, defense of his light squares. However, if you look at black's light square bishop, this is black's good bishop. Why do I say that? Because all the pawns are on dark squares. Making the bishop on f6 the problem bishop or the bad bishop. This bishop is horrible right now. And moves have to be made in order to make it respectable. I mean, that bishop would like to be here. So, but moves like g6 would have to be made. Bishop g7, perhaps even h5, king h7, and then bishop h6. You know, in the, in the fantasy world, those, you know, white gets to make moves too. But it takes a lot of work to make that bishop on f6 any good. So out of the two bishops, this is the best one. And that's not saying much because this bishop is biting on granite in the center. However, going back to the question of of which who would benefit more from the exchange of the light square bishops, I have to say white. Because after uh, black loses his dark square bishop, he has no representation on the light squares. Like who's watching? Who's watching these squares now? There's no pawns. He has no pawns 
or anything to cover his light squares. So his light squares will be become very weak. Look at uh now the knight can jump here freely. Doesn't have to worry about being exchanged. You see by this bishop on a6. This square. Get rid of some of the arrows. But you get the point. All of the light squares become very vulnerable after the absence of the dark square bishop. So with that with that said I'm going to go and say that bishop c8 is a positional a, a, a slight positional mistake. Maybe he should have just waited just a little more on that. Just wait, you know, that's kind of like it's not really clear whether he should trade yet. I know it's annoying having this um bishop on h3, but maybe he should just wait a little bit and then and do something more um you know, a little better. For instance, we know this bishop on f6 is terrible. So let's work on that problem because we know for sure that that piece has to be uh, moved somewhere else. Right? So perhaps a move like bishop e7. Right? And maybe g6 and f5 or something. You know, just in general. Right? And I understand this move is hindering the plan. You know? But I would just want to wait just a little more. Even a move like a4. Right, so he does this, <clears throat> and Wesley Soul plays Rook H one. So he doesn't want to give. He doesn't want to play like this because he doesn't want to give um, uh, Richard Report the light square diagonal. But to me, it's not a big deal. For instance, Queen E two. Bishop e7 and knight d2 and we we still have a, a good game I mean even though black has this diagonal uh, it's not it shouldn't be too bad okay so he goes to the h file and so now the rook is on h3 this looks awkwardly placed to me and he still takes over the diagonal anyway and the thing about it is now the rooks are connected you see so if he did it the other way you know just take sorry so if Wesley soldiers took at least the rooks wouldn't be connected he would have to use another temple you might say oh that's no big deal but he would have to use another tempi to uh, connect the rooks. Okay. So instead, he does that. And now the rooks are connected. And the rook is kind of bizarrely placed there on uh, h3. Knight h2. H5. It's an interesting move. Preventing this move G4. Okay. So he's fixing, fixing these pawns. I like Black's position. F3. Again, so is still playing on the king side. And I think there's something strategically wrong in this, this, this position here. Because I really think that white should have been playing on the queen side. There's g6. And we see black is starting to um, go along with this, this plan. I don't know if I like the insertion of h4 there. But... I can understand that he wants to leave this rook misplaced. In other words, he doesn't want he didn't want to allow he didn't want to allow, for instance, after G six, say if he went with G six right away, then this move right here and opening up and basically justifying justifying uh the rook being on H three. 
So <clears throat> it makes it makes perfect sense why he would do that. Right, so he plays h5, so he fixes that, and now the rook is is awkwardly placed there. So f3, g6, g4, and now we have the now it's a battle of ideas. So Wesley So has decided to play on the king on the king side here, which is dang, which is, is you know is, is dangerous, is double edged, because this is the side where um, Richard Rapport wants to play on. It should be playing on. So the king moves. Clearing the G file for the big pieces. Notice how the rooks aren't able to do much. Unless a file is open. And that's one of the big um, important strategical um uh, concepts in the closed game is finding a place of uh, finding open files for the rooks and trying to anticipate where the files will be opened because if you uh, don't anticipate or put your rooks on the right squares you'll find yourself uh, wasting time moving the rooks around so for example this rook on c1 has been there a long time, but there's nothing happening on the C file, and White didn't follow up with the logical plan of 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 B3, A3, B4, and C5 opening up the C file. So he put the rook there, but then decided not to do anything. You know, it's kind of like buying a piece of property or real estate and then not renovating it or opening up. Just opening up shop just leaving a, like an abandoned building storefront there or something see so now he decides hey that rook is misplaced and now he's gonna put his um you know all his chips you know in right now and try to attack on the king side rook g8 so now instead of this idea with the f file as i mentioned earlier Change of plans. Still attacking on the king's side, but he decides to move the rook over to the G file. Anticipating opening of the G file. Queen to D1. Bishop G7. And notice the time here. We see report as good, you know, good time uh, advantage here. 57 minutes to 32 minutes. So now we see bishop g7 played. And I like this move because you might say, well, why is he blocking this rook rook right here? Well, he's improving. He wants to improve the bishop and bring him to uh, age 6. So bringing the bishop, improving the bishop, it's a beautiful dark square. And again... We can have the same conversation we had earlier with the light square bishops. Notice that black is the only one. Notice that black is the only one with the bishop. With the dark square bishop. So he's in a position to dominate these dark squares. If he can get outside of his own uh, pawn chain. The bishop, can, the bishop will have a good career. So bishop g7. Knight f1. And this knight. Suffers from lack of uh, lack of outpost here. You know, after the knight comes to the to the third rank, where is it gonna go after that? Wesley Soul's plan Soul's plan is real simple. He has the rooks. <clears throat> he has the rooks, and and I believe he stands worse here. By the way, not not you know by a big disadvantage, but I think Black is just a little better here. Now. Knight f1 has a simple idea of going to g3 and putting more pressure on this pawn. Of course, in a perfect world, so would love for uh, Richard Report to take uh, on g4 so he can play h5 and open up the position for the rooks. But we're not gonna, he's not going to let that happen. There it is, bishop h6, like I said, to improve the uh, career of the bishop here. And... Listen, if g5, the bishop will come back 
and then f6 will be played so that will be like that that move is not serious because a lot of people are, oh what about f6 f6 plays in the into black's hands bishop g7 would happen and then followed by f6 and the rook would rooks would return to the f file let's see what happened king f2 Corso does not make the you know the move of just closing up that position right there and his rooks would be terrible now interesting <laughs> interesting move here um again this this square master is something else uh <laughs> uh richard report is something else man that that's some that move is is like whoa <laughs> you know um to me again black is better i like simple moves like bishop f4 just you know just real just give me something simple you know for instance knight g3 you know and then uh I don't know. May, maybe he does take hit. H takes, and then if and then if H five, then he pushes. Keep the position nice and close. Even better still. Why not crash through with F five? You got the king right here. You know, rooks right here. This rook is ready to come. Queen here. Just a, just a thought. This move right here is not bad. Not bad at all. Um, very inter very interesting move. Now, the attacks this pawn right here, and the idea behind if you can't see it, you know, I have to show you because the idea is just a simple fork right here, right? So, so he threatens, he brings a bishop all the way and threatens a pawn on the king side. Now that's a slick looking move, but uh Wesley so uh grasped the spirit of the position. This is the type of position where um somebody's getting mated. So a distant a pawn you know, on the flank like this B two pawn is really you know, not the most you know, not the most important thing. But a pawn is a pawn is a pawn. A bishop C one is a clever clever move though. There's knight g3. He takes with an attack on the piece. Nothing wrong with that. The knight goes knight goes up here. Now at this point, um again, I <laughs> I I just I see black is is being better here. You know, black has black has, has played very well. He goes back to to this great diagonal here. You see how powerful the bishop is now? Once he once he was able to escape the prison of his own pawns. It took some time, but once he got that bishop out there, the bishop became very, very powerful in the position. However, with that said, perhaps and this is an interesting move right here, bishop d four, right? Knight takes. And of course, the idea is to penetrate the position. Now that this queen has been deflected from d1, now this queen is coming in. Right? Invasion time. That's the idea behind that. And there's a nice in-between move here too. Instead of capturing the knight right away, now you can play that move with the threat against the rook. So now that the the uh, rook is uh, threatened, f takes g4, and now e takes d4. h5, one in to open this up, and of course we keep the position closed by playing g5. And again, now if queen takes, remember this queen was protecting the g4 square. Instead of us coming here this time, now we just capture here. This is winning for black. 
So let me s say right now that that was that was uh, close to a knockout blow. That was like a hard shot right there. If uh, uh, Richard Rapport was able to find that, so he plays G takes H5, West uh, Wesley So, and Bishop F4. So he made a natural move. He basically came in, stole a pawn like Robin Hood, and went back to the castle on F4. So knight c3, f5. Now I have been speaking about f5 early, early in the game, and finally we see we see the uh, thematic breakthrough here. F5. Game is very sharp. There's a check. Rook takes g6, and notice these rooks are still behind these behind this pawn. Looking, it looks a little suspect, a little misplaced here. However, there's some some play here. For instance, knight takes f5, it's possible. Wesley so goes for it. And again, notice what I said earlier about the absence of the light square bishop and the weakness of the white squares. So you see now white benefiting from the absence of the light square bishop. So Friends, always be careful when making decisions like that, giving, giving up the bishop here. You know, one bishop, always rem always think about the future of the uh, your um, representation on the squares. Like, how are you going to protect those squares later? So now you got this knight just sitting on f5. How how can black get it, get rid of it? Not that it makes a difference right here, but, you know, you have to consider those type of things. Now the natural move is just rook a g8 because white's rooks aren't well placed. Black rooks are. I mean, the idea is real simple. Now notice too how I said earlier how white's movements on the king side helped black to infiltrate. So this this game right here is is just based to me like strategically winning for black. The only way black can lose is he has to make some type of egregious egregious error in calculation or something like that. This is a model model game how to how to deal with um you know how to play on the flanks once the center is closed. I made another video about dealing with early or premature flank attacks. This this is a game uh where the flank attacks aren't premature. However, white played strategically on the wrong side of the board. Now, Wesley Wesley So somehow w was able to win this game, and we're gonna find out. But this position, the position is is um, it's kind of tenuous for White here. He should have played on the queen side, and his play on the king side, to me, facilitated Black's chances in mating him. So King F1, Rapport finds B4. Excuse me, B5. Which is which is um be just a beautiful move. The idea is if knight takes b5, and we got the rook, the rook coming coming into the um, right because this knight was protecting his pawn. Now we had the rook here, and then say if he tries to hop back. You see, and this this is just trouble right here. That's losing. Again, same idea. If C takes, Rook takes, and I don't know. Let's let's just make a move like A4. Same idea. Rook D2. Whoops, sorry. So after b5, c takes b5. He decided to keep the knight, and he went in. He actually played this, and the rook came to the second rank. So right here, black is, um, to me, in my eyes, black is winning. I mean, you have to win the game, but, you know, you would like to follow black's example here. Okay, queen b1. Right, so he anticipates the rook coming there. 
Now, for some reason, report, and this is what I was talking about, making a big error. This is a blunder. Like I said, I don't know if anybody else has made a video or mentioned this yet. Queen F7 is a blunder. This is a blunder. He gives away all his advantages. I mean, he's pra practically winning right here at the Rook D2. This is like frustrating about chess sometimes. At the Rook, Rook D2, which is so natural because you're going to bring the other Rook here. Like, why not make the natural moves? It's like people over-calculate the position. Man, this is a beautiful game. Uh, God, ah, God, throw, throws it away. Hmm. I mean, it's natural. Is get the rooks to the seventh and eighth ranks, double up, and win. Ah. <sighs> so rook D, and I'm not a report fan. I'm a chess fan. I like to see the games come to the logical conclusion. But we know that there's no justice over the chessboard. So Rook D2, right? That, you know, you heard it right here. That's the winning move. Now, of course, he wants to stop the black Rook from the other Rook coming from the G file. So Rook G1 is natural. Right? Now you just heard him. Play a move like Queen E8. And basically all white can do is try to clog up the G file. So for instance, if he does a move like knight G3, then you just double up. No proper defense here. So if you try to defend like that, this knight comes in here and ruins, ruins everything by guarding these squares, driving the queen away. Queen is lost. Queen has to play like, you know, Queen D2. Like some computer moves and stuff like that. If he tries to clog up the file by Rook G3, then you just take it. Easy. If he just tries to move over, say King H1. Knight D3 with the old fork threat. Tries to go this way. King F1. Right? A little distraction there. Knight A4. What's the main idea? Distract. Get that knight away. Queen G8. Threatening mate. And then you had the same ideas with the pieces getting sna uh, snatched up. Whew. So, after Queen B1... Instead of making a natural move, Rook D2 and just doubling up. Plays Queen F7. Knight E2, now what happens? Oh, excuse me. Now what happens? The Knight is now blocking the D2 square. So now, uh, Black cannot double, up, double his Rooks. And... He's threatening to capture this powerful bishop. But most importantly, he's blocking the axis. Queen g6. And now, he even allows a fork here. And notice the time is the same. Remember, there's a, like a half an hour time difference? So we see that So is getting a grasp on the position. Rapport is losing his grasp on the position. So now he just allows a simple fork. And of course, he saw the fork, but it's based on miscalculation. Because that's what usually happens. If, if a grandmaster allows a move like that, it's not that he didn't see it. He saw it and then mi miscalculated. Right? So here's the miscalculation. Rook takes f2. King takes f2. Queen g2 check. And he probably figures... You know he's gonna he's gonna be winning in short order. King e1. Now you got this move rook g3, 
right? He see he sees all of this stuff when he when he allowed the knight to come to f7. Right? Rook takes. Check. Now look at that. He's like, whoa, I'm gonna get the queen. You know? He's feeling good about everything. The rook comes back. The queen takes f3. And now he sees the knight coming here, right? With the bishop. Guarding this, he's like, I gotta be winning, right? I'm sure he's seen all of that in a, like a haze, and he said, I have to be winning here. There goes the beautiful bishop. Right now, the problem is <clears throat> these light squares, right? Now, of course, he can't go here because this would be mate. However, he can come here. And this is probably what... This is probably what... Um, Richard Rapport overlooked. But even if he comes there, he's still winning. See, if he goes knight f2... Right? Right, he has that. Now Wesley So makes a bold move here because he could have he could have tried to go for a draw you know panic but he calculated Wesley So showing that he showing this world championship class and caliber and he he's he's sending signals out into the universe that hey I'm coming for that world championship so Queen takes D three Queen takes D three. Now you got queen versus three pieces. And the position's kind of semi-open, but mostly blocked. But one of the main features here is this rook. The rook here on this G file blocking this king in. Right? Knight G8 is played. So... <clears throat> setting up a deadly uh, mating attack here. This stops the um, knight from coming back to f6 and delivering a uh, check. h5 beautiful move because what's going to happen is when this knight finally does get here it will protect this pawn. And then there's a rook and knight mate um, combination. You should look at rook and knight mates. Because you'll be able to see it from here. Goes back. See now if the knight is here. The rook mates here. Rook can mate by being on this square. Or the g8 square or the h7 square with the knight on f6. However... Wesley Soul has to answer the question, well, how do I get the knight to f6? How do I, with the queen here? Right? So, we have to create some diversionary tactics to get this queen out of the way. Rook g6. Right? Simple solution. Notice how he leaves this pawn right here on priest. Because it doesn't matter. If queen takes, then he simply picks up the queen by playing rook here. Let me show you. Queen here. He just play this. Right? Queen is a great attacking piece, but poor defender. So if you could get the queen backpedaling and force to defend, um, you're on your way. Queen, the queen is a great attacking piece from poor, poor defender. It's only one unit. That's the that's the thing about the queen. It's only one unit, so it, it you know, they only do so much. So we see the coordinated pieces here. So, all right. So, the threat here is. To play the knight to f6. Now all black has 
is uh, uh to look, be able to tie to look for some type of perpetual. So queen h1 check. King d2. And he grabs the uh grabs the pawn and he's not just trying to grab the pawn but he's just trying to clear, you know, get as much much text in as possible. So queen takes e4. Knight f6. Protecting that. And attacking the queen and threatening mate. His mate in one. So. Check. King e3. And that is all she wrote. There's no way to stop. There's no way to stop the mate on um, g8 from a coming. This knight does a beautiful job. Defending. Defending the dark squares around the king. Right? This pawn defends that square. Let me just show you all the squares that's defended. Right? So everything, everything is defended around the king. There's really no, no more uh, legitimate checks. There's queen a3 and c5 basically. So if queen a3, then king f2. Queen c5 and king f1. There's no more checks. Queen there is is meant by the knight. Okay. All that black can do is give up the queen to stop the mate here. So, for instance, to stop rook, <laughs> rook there, but then the knight would just simply pick up the queen. If queen c5, then, of course, we can't go back to f2. We keep moving. King f3. And, again, there's no more um, legitimate checks. You know, of course, there's this queen takes d5, which just loses the queen. And, again, this uh, puts the queen too far away after, um, you know, for instance, king g2. Um, so, report was uh report was forced to uh give it up a full you know full queen ahead you know due to this mate threat so um i hope you enjoyed that game it's a very exciting game uh frustrating one for me because um black black played a great game um and was definitely winning uh, you could take that to the bank you know after rook g2 and um again queen f7 was just but you know based on mis miscalculation he thought that it would be enough for him just to occupy the g file but he needed to occupy um white second rank and um so instead of again queen f7 33 queen f7 was the the major blunder this move right here is the killer rook 33 rook d2 with the idea of just simply um you know, with the idea of simply just penetrating to uh, the second rank. So, as usual, please like and subscribe. And uh, thanks for listening. And I'll see you later on in the tournament.